I'm going to be reading a little bit, but more in a kind of conversation with you all. Um, my title on being included um, comes from a scholar, um, a feminist thinker, um, Sarah Ahmed. Um, and I've included the statement after that again and again and again. And I'd like to use it again and again and again and again, because just to mark out the terrain of my discussion today, conversations over inclusivity and diversity are long conversations. We've been having them for so long now, I sometimes wonder if cultural institutions will ever change, or are we just doing it because we like to talk those words? So that's basically my first challenge to you. What might it mean for cultural institutions to take those words seriously? And secondly, to mark out the specific terrain in which we operate now, where, and I hope I am allowed to do this, I didn't consult first, but forgive me right after I say it, where activists in the Netherlands, like all other parts of the world I know of right now, who are invested in museums, are saying, fuck diversity, decolonize. They are no longer interested in diversity as a practice because they feel that it has done nothing. So we're going to in, in, in engage in that kind of discussion um, today. And that's why I call it the per perpetual return. I'm going to read a little just because every time I give a lecture, people always come up to me and they say, wow, that was emotional. And my intention is not to use emotions. There is some theory behind it as well. So I'm going to read a little so that you know that I can be theoretical. And then I do the emotional labor so that you, you're all right with that. So one of the things that I want to start out to you are four quotes. Just as a starting point for our thinking, what does it mean to be a public institution in the present? If we understand ourselves to occupy a particular moment in Europe today, a particular moment in Western Europe today, some would say, or in Europe more generally, a moment marked by Brexit, but marked by other anxieties about the failure of the multicultural polity, the failure of inclusion, integration, and a failure that many of us in our policy regimes, political regimes, project onto some other person, those people who are coming in to take over, those people who are perpetual migrants. They've been here since 19 whenever, but we still talk about them as migrants. What does it mean to be a public institution? What does publicness mean when we start thinking critically about them, those thems, as part of our public? And I want to make an even more uncomfortable statement marking a question that was asked earlier. What does it mean when every time we talk about the inclusion of others, a question that is asked is, and this is not a criticism of the question, but is an important question, does that compromise the quality or the integrity of the arts? What does it mean that when we include people, the idea is the quality is going to be less? Because you ask the question, did you invite them in because they are good? Or did you invite them in just because they're a woman or a person of color? So my question then is, do we ask ourselves that question internally? Are we good enough inside for the work that we need to do? Because to ask the question outside is to presume that the person isn't good enough, and it presumes that we internally are stellar and excellent. <laughs> Might that not be so? Could be, eh? I want to trouble you with that. My second question is, and this comes directly from the mission of our museum, what does it mean to be a you and you and you here in the front to be responsible to feel a sense of responsibility for the world we share with others and the others we share the world with. I take that up in this moment of anxiety about climatic futures and the world around us, but also coinciding two very big um, 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 anxiety that we have in Europe today. One is about the future of our environment 
the future of our planet. And the second one is the future of our multicultural polity. Sorry to say this, Stephen, but Brexit marks out a very apocalyptic notion about multiculturalism. But we shouldn't blame Brexit because in many of the places we inhabit in Europe today, we also think through that apocalypse. What does it mean to feel a responsibility for the world we share with others? My third question, and this is a struggle for me. Somebody said just now that the two presentations were um, sad, that was the word? Pessimistic. Pessimistic. And to be honest with you, I, I am the, I, 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 I don't believe in this thing of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not optimistic because as we look around what is happening today, especially me anyway, I can't say for you, I don't see much to be optimistic about. But I want to shift your register a little bit um, to something um, Terry Eagleton speaks about. Perhaps we should stop thinking in terms of the glass half full or the glass half empty, which is about optimism and pessimism, depending on the way you look at it. As I said in my last talk that I was here, no matter how I look at it, the glass is still half. It's just half. I want to sketch another kind of horizon. And the horizon that I want to suggest for you today is that I'm hopeful. Hope is a stubborn impatience with the present. Hope is activism for me. Activism that says that this is crap and we're not going to stay with it, we want something else. Hope is what people believe in when there's nothing to be optimistic about. This emerges from my other part of my work where I work on questions of slavery and notions of freedom. Because in a society, for example, and this is not to make it to point a finger, but in a society like the US that is marked by a narrative constitutionally of notions of freedom and equality, the enslaved, for the enslaved, there was no, no such notion. There was a foreclosure of that possibility because there was a foreclosure of the possibility of them being human. But the enslaved had hope because what they wanted to do with hope was to imagine the extension of the notion of freedom that would include more humans in it, which is themselves. So in a way, what they did was to reorganize the notion of freedom in itself, of justice. And I want to suggest that that is what women did when they fought for the right to vote. Because as men, you speak about yourself as the white man. What I will speak about myself as a short black man from wherever. As men, we also foreclose the possibility of their political rights. What does it mean, the right to a vote? So they too fought to open that possibility for what actually our understanding of human rights are. In that sense, they too were hopeful I don't think of that as optimism. And my last point, and then I start reading a little, and then I go through some things. I struggle with the notion, no, let me give you this one. Rather than being pessimistic, I want to change your view by suggesting that we occupy the most hopeful moment in the world today. And I don't want to, it doesn't, that's not an attempt at exaggeration, but rather in the place where I work, I work in what is called a folk Kunde museum, an ethnographic museum, and every day, everybody criticizes that as the most hopeless museum in the world. <laughs> that's where all of colonialism is put. It is the most colonial institution ever. I've been trying to push it away and say also that the opera is a little colonial and art institutions are a little colonial as well. But one of the things that I want us to hold on to here, and I know that many museums professionals who work in institutions, especially in parts of Europe where there are a lot of activists pushing against the museum, 
And it is one of the most uncomfortable feeling in the world. You know, you're going to an event and your stomach feel really tight because you don't know what you're going to do. And are, are they going to cuss you out on, on, on Facebook? That kind of what we call in the Netherlands cramp, that tight feeling in your stomach. Actually, my last point to you, and then I'm going to sit down, is that rather than imagine that as a terrible thing, and activism as a bad thing that are, is taking us over and terribly tearing apart our quality. Perhaps we should imagine it as a radical impatience with the present and a hope for a future moment when something anew can be created. I occupy that position every day to think that we are in a hopeful space because we are all part of their activism. So I'm going to read a little for you, and then probably sing a little, I'm not so sure yet. <laughs> I do that when I'm nervous. And I want to start out, that was what I was going to do. I want to start out with the, the new um, ICOM definition. I don't want to put anybody on, 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 on at, to make you uncomfortable, but I really, really want to ask you who supported it and who didn't. I won't ask, it's all right, no, no, because some people might feel bad to say that they didn't. <laughs> no, no, it's all right, it's like, it's like going to people and ask them, Did you, are you pro or against Brexit? They don't want to tell you. <laughs> I don't want to do that. One of the difficulties with this definition for us though, when we looked at democratizing, inclusive, polyphonic, and the idea that we were going to be interested in questions of human dignity, social justice, and planetary well-being, is that I must say that when we as a museum saw this definition, we felt that it coincided with our mission. It felt that, oh, this was describing what we are interested in doing. This is not to suggest that the, as a, as a, as a definition, the, the questions about the definition, but I wonder whether or not the museum of the present is a museum where those words become very urgent. I wonder, even if they are not definitional, if they can define our practice. Um, amidst the anxious politics that animates discussions about the present and future of Europe, battles over inclusion, over questions of belonging and citizenship, over who is considered to be European are also battles over what constitutes the notion of European heritage. Cultural studies theorist Stuart Hall brought this to our attention already in the mid-1990s when he asked in his Whose Heritage? Unsettling Heritage, Reimagining the Post-Nation, he asks, whose heritage is it for anyway? He continues to argue that, I quote, in Britain, in the, in the British case, the answer is clear. It is intended for those who belong, a society which is imagined as, in broad terms, culturally um, homogeneous and unified. Undoubtedly, similar claims could be made of other parts of um, um, Europe today, including the Netherlands where I sit. Indeed, imagining uh, imaginations of European belonging as homogeneous both culturally and racially, have only intensified in recent years, manifesting in growing exclusionary political formations and characterized by increased forms of xenophobia and Islamophobic nationalism. Some scholars have called this the culturalization of citizenship. Others have insisted that we need to continue to address the raced nature of such exclusionary discourse. Those forms of imagining the nation presume that the multicultural project, that pluralizing polity we have come to know across Europe, North America, and other places across the world, which Hall identifies as having started for Europe in earnest in the aftermath of World War II, that multicultural project has failed. At least on this account, it is dead. In the nar this narrative, Formerly colonized people and labor migrants now living in parts of Europe are, imagining, are imagined as a threat to European identity, to its culture, through its housing stock, through its welfare provisions. 
it is they, according to this argument, that do not belong. They do not fit. Paul declares it is long past to radically question this foundational assumption. I, like many other scholars, included, I'm sure, here in this room, continue to question the proclaimed death of multiculturalism. Yet the death that I want to talk about today is possibly another death. Are we seeing the demise of inclusion and diversity as notions that we work with? Now, for me, and I was very pleased this morning with the discussion because I'm going to be honest and say many museum studies discussions I find boring. I find them boring because they very often do not want to actually address the political domain of what is culture. So when I heard Stephen this morning and Anna speak, they were really getting at the nitty gritty at what does it mean to think class and class exclusion. I would suggest that popular music is another, we probably should put more, more money to popular music because more people participate in it than the opera. But that's another story altogether. Let's not talk about the opera again for the day, all right? <laughs> but I was interested in what does it mean to think? And it is the first conference that I've been to where the question of intersectionality has been raised. What does it mean to think the overlapping concerns for questions of class, gender, sexualities, and race within the language of inclusion that we use in our museum? What does it mean for us to always feel anxious when it comes to certain narratives around inclusion? How many of you in this audience will very easily, when somebody says, but, and I'm going to, not name a particular group, when somebody says, we need to address the fact that certain ethno, ethnic, eth, ethnicized or racialized groups do not come to our museums, how many of us get anxious? And the first thing that we say is, but it's not only about race. And then we name class, gender, sexuality, uh, left tight, um, age, and we continue to name a whole litany of things that we need to address without also understanding the overlap that these litanies mean. How many of us do that because we have an anxiety in our stomach, really cramp, to actually talk about the fact that racialized exclusion is happening in our institutions and we don't want to talk about the concept of race. In the Netherlands, I can tell you that is the case. Many people find racializing discourses so uncomfortable that they just can't deal with it as a conversation. Some people find class discussions uncomfortable, so they can't listen. So what does it mean to think diversity when we can't even name the modalities of exclusion that makes people, keeps people outside? This has been a struggle within political philosophy for a long time. I work with a particular scholar who I really love, um, Iris Marian Young. Some scholars don't like her work at all, or they like her work, but they criti criticize her. Because Iris Marian Young was interested in a, a conversation about structural exclusion. And what are the structures in your institution that causes some people to feel pushed back? So one thing, for example, we in our museum do, and then I go to conjuncture, is that in our museum we say, we're trying to think about what language we use even at the, the, the information Bali. I don't know, at the end of the day we have a, a, an announcement in our museum which says, ladies and gentlemen, the museum is now going to close. Please, punchy, punchy, punchy. And we do it in four languages. But what does it mean that somebody who is, imagines themselves as non-binary is not included in that ladies and gentlemen announcement? Should they stay in the museum? <laughs> is that what we're talking about? But also, another simple, simple thing. My kind of museum as well struggles with another kind of discourse, and we just did a book on it called Words Matter. And in the Words Matter book, we went through and we chose 54 words 
that we would either never use again in the museum text or in our, how we address people. Those 54 words are very difficult, come more, mostly out of my kind of museum, so an ethnographic museum. And one of the things that we said is that language is abusive. Language can be abusive, but not only in the terms of visitors. So what is written on the text boards? Are the text boards written in such a way that people feel welcomed, aggressed, excluded? And I want to show you a little project we did recently, this one, called Decolonize the Museum. And what we did was that we, in, we, in, we invited a group of three young people to come into the museum at the Tropa Museum and look at every single aspect of the museum's um, publicness to try and understand how do people feel in relationship to some of our practices. When many people thought about decolonizing the museum, they thought that it was going to be a conversation only around um, race as a structure or questions of colonial afterlives. But for the team of decolonizing the museum, it was a more embedded structure. So one of the things, for example, which we had was that we did not have good facilities for the disabled. Actually, if you were a disabled person, one of the only ways to get upstairs was to go through a um, hoodrel, um, the elevator for, um, for goods. So we have to pull you around to give you that. And one of the, one of the participants, she was, she was really upset. She said, what are you saying to that visitor? Your goods. <laughs> what are you saying to that visitor? So one of the things that decolonizing the museum helped us to do was to try and think about the complex intermingling of an institution that says that it is public for a changing public, but that in our structures, in the intimacies of our structures, we were not doing public work at all. But it was not only that. I had an email recently from one of my colleagues to somebody outside, inviting her to participate in a clunk board group, which is that a, a focus group that we were organizing. And the email itself was not intended as bad, but the email was so racialized and put the person in a box that the person said, you know, I can't do this. And funnily enough, somebody even asked me recently, they asked me to be an expert on an expertise panel. And they said to me, um, Wayne, I'd like you to be an expert on this expertise panel. And I said, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with this. And, and, and eventually, what? <laughs> In the Netherlands, we have a little bit of a funny way of talking sometimes. She said, I asked her why, and she said, because you have a little color. <laughs> and I thought, that's not the kind of honesty, you know. It's a, it's a kind of honesty. But, but even what, what was at stake in this discussion in Decolonize the Museum was my colleagues from outside asking, what are the microaggressions that operate internal to your organization that makes people from different, um, different plural backgrounds not feel at home in meetings as members of staff when they go to the coffee machine, those kinds of things? How do you ensure that your meeting environment is somewhere that is safe and does not presume a normalization of one form of thinking. You understand what I'm saying? Tell me, if you don't, yeah? All right, good. It was within that frame that we started as a museum to think about how do we reorganize ourselves? And what, um, and I want to go back to um, this statement which comes again from Stuart Hall, who I'm, I, I really love. And Stuart Hall has, how much time do I have left? Brilliant, brilliant. Stuart Hall speaks of a conjuncture, a moment of danger or of opportunity that was something to intervene in, 
a configuration whose components were to be rearranged through practice. It was a call to action. And I want to ask you, what is the current conjuncture? Where are you from, if I may ask? Portugal. What is the current conjuncture in Portugal? What is happening here now as a political space to think about the location in which your museum operates? What are the questions that are being asked? In the Netherlands, it is a very, very difficult discussion about whether or not cultural institutions are just too white. It is about what do we do with the black peat figure, a, 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 a black face figure that comes out every December and whether or not that is inclusive heritage. It is about whose heritage that is. Actually, the most recent discussion is one museum that decided that they were going to scrap the use of the word the golden age. Because what the golden age does is that it hides the fact that within the golden age was a lot of slavery and colonization. That caused a lot of discomfort. Um, and I'm even ashamed to say it, but I'll say it anyway, where even our prime minister jumped into the discussion and said he was not in agreement with the discussion to scrap it. What we should do is to try and create a new golden age. Now, now, I just want to leave that one there. <laughs> I must admit that as a citizen of the Netherlands, when he said that, I didn't feel loved. But just let's just, I just want to leave that there. But it is an asking of the question, what does it mean that museums are still trying to include us, include us, include us on their terms, rather than asking the question, what is the new terms that need to be re-inaugurated re so that our inclusion isn't about you? How might the, sorry, Stephen, how might the opera look differently if the starting point isn't from its genealogy with that particular population that created it and still goes there, classed, raced, what might it look like differently if it was reorganized outside of them as the starting point for thinking? I've always said many cities are created by men, designed. How many places to, um, sorry, I'm going to be rude again, sorry. How many places are there for men to pee on the streets? No, what are called pissoirs, these little things. They're all over little city because men can't control themselves, of course, after the bar. <laughs> but it organizes itself in such a way that they, they can deal with their un, uncontrol. And then you go to a pub and you see four stalls for men to pee. And then you go to the, the ladies' bathroom and what you see is that there's two stalls, and they have to join a line outside to get in. How do we reorganize the cultural institution that pushes against the normalization of one group? Because if we do not do that, that's not inclusion. What that is, it is it's a, it's a form of what, what, what we would call in integration, assimilation, conversation. It's a form of assimilation. You need to come in and work in the way that I say you need to come in. And that's what happens when directors like me, you know, men directors start having jokes about how women do this and women do this or whatever. So my question to you today and to the, the challenge that I, I want to leave with you today, on the one hand is because, you know, I don't want to generalize the conversation from the Netherlands to here. I, in my last lecture here, um, there was an article that came out in the paper, and I couldn't read it because it was in Portuguese. <laughs> and, and so I don't know what it said. Um, but one of the things that I don't want to do is to generalize the argument that the multicultural practices that exist in the Netherlands should be everywhere else. To be honest, 
One of the difficulties moving from London, where I worked in the Horniman Museum, to the Netherlands, where I worked in the Tropa Museum, is that when I moved from London, I could easily use the word community because it was tied to this thing called black, Asian, and minority ethnic. When I went to the Netherlands, I could never use the word community because nobody, the, the people got anxious of the splitting. And when I speak to my colleagues in France, there is also the notion that community is not a, a language that you can use. So my intention is not a generalization. My intention is to ask you, what is the conjuncture of this moment here, but also in England and in the places where you work which means that the structure of the institutions in which we work marginalize some people and continue to marginalize them under the nomenclature of normality. And that normality is about, but they aren't experts as we are experts. Did they get their jobs only because they were of color or gender? But it normalizes it based on our ability or ableness. And I will turn to my last thing. I have a part in my paper here which I speak about the genealogy of, um, of diversity talk in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we started to do diversity and inclusion from 1980s. That was a part of the museum practice, tied with a government minister's principle which wanted to ensure that immigrants were going to be included. We've been doing that forever. And I want to suggest that, and this was, came up in the, in the presentation before, because of the intersectional, not only of intersectional idea, identities or identification, but because of the intermingling structure of education, schools, institutions, government, and policymakers, what you find is that the radical change towards an inclusive program in museums have not happened. There aren't a lot of people being trained as anthropologists, for example, of diverse backgrounds who would work as, 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 as anthropologists in my museum. If I stick to anthropology as the only domain from which curatorial expertise can come, then my museums will never change. Why I said that I was going to sing to you is that when I was little, I wanted to be an opera singer. And, and to be honest, that is true. It is true. Um, I, I had done a lot of singing. I had been on choirs and so. And um, when I moved to the Netherlands, I even found a voice tutor. I started doing museum studies, and then I decided, oh, I want to um, study something else. And then I decided, no, music is not going to be it because it, um, musicians are too poor. And if you want to be rich, you need to work in a, in a museum. <laughs> So look, look at me now, right? Look at me now. Um, but, but now I, I hear Stephen say that somebody earns a million Euro, um, pounds, then I think I need to change jobs. <laughs> but the question is, if we aren't going to address it as an integrated structure of critique of the very structures that ex exist to exclude, then I'm not so sure that I'm hopeful at all that things are going to change. So I want to close my, my thinking anyway with a few more discomfort, discomforting things. And then we can ask questions. If inclusive histories is the work of museums, the work, your work here, activists and academics from diverse stakeholder groups are tired of diversity. This is also the conjunction in which we are. This is captured when the slogan adopted a few years ago by some activists were, was fuck diversity, decolonize. Indeed, mounting critique from social movements such as Black Lives Matter, No, no Dakota Pipe, Pipeline, Roads Must Fall, um, or in, in, the, in the Netherlands, the Museum of Color and the University of Color that are pushing for equitable and inclusive presents and futures to the most recent quarrel in Oxford 
about the ethics of diversity, the ethics of empire, mark out a very special moment that we are in today. These calls challenge the very ways in which diversity seemed to reinforce a particular position. It reinforced a particular group as being in charge. It reinforced a particular category or way of doing. One scholar, Vertovec, who is the coiner of the term superdiversity, he suggests that in itself, we should move away from the term itself as not being useful anymore, as hiding too much. And another scholar, Rinaldo Walcott, has proposed the end of diversity, she calls it. For her, by the middle of the 1980s, at least in Canada, scholars and activists moved on from the language and rhetoric of diversity to a language that she in, thinks of as anti-racism. For her, there was an acknowledgement of a stalled non-performativity of diversity to produce any kind of justice. Is our inclusion policy about justice, about a just future, or is it about the happy multiculturalism that we all inhabit, which is always talking about the good food we eat, the whatever, but not really thinking about how we change structures. So, so when we did the, um, the decolonizing museum event, um, so they did a process, we changed it, and the, <laughs> these, are our, these were the text boards that they produced. Now, any, any, who works in museum here? Everybody, yeah? yeah? No? One of the interesting about this is that if you work in a museum, this is already anxiety creating. <laughs> One of the things you learn in museums is that the amount of text you put is about 72 words, at most 200 in a different place, and then whatever, whatever. And then they came with text for 500 words. And of course, everybody said, no, 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 that cannot, that cannot. But also, the text was quite feisty. The text basically said, as a museum, we've been racist for a while, and we continue racism. As a museum, the befeiligers, um, the front of house people, continue to practice exclusion based on, um, what do you call it, um, profiling. And there was a moment in this project where we thought, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do this, we can't do this, we can't put it up. And in the team, we were thinking, we've now given them carte blanche to do what they want, and we want to take that back. <laughs> there was even a moment when they decide, as young people normally do, that they want to go and do this on Twitter. And we were thinking that it would have been a closed workshop where you know, we could talk together and learn. And so my marketing manager, and I, I'm talking about her out of turns here, she said, but shouldn't we also sit beside them and retweet, retweet to say the good things that we're doing as well? <laughs> And we decided not to. And to be honest with you, I'm not so sure we're deserving of it. This made us go out into the papers as being a colonizing museum, a colonial museum. But it also meant, and this is what I'm saying, that I'm not so sure we're deserving of it. It also meant that we could work on the next project with a group of activists who believe that we're committed through integrity to working with them in the future. That we really take seriously the work that we want to do and that we want to change. That we can deal with discomfort in a way. Because I can tell you, I said this the last time, two weeks before this event happened, I didn't sleep very much. I just had all sorts of um, pain in my stomach, stomach pain, whatever, because I was afraid, okay, I'm losing my job now, I'm losing my job. <laughs> But it reorganizes us, but it also does something. And this is where I'd like to, um, it meant that when we're curating an exhibition, we curate an exhibition with the same team of young people who read through, who come with us at the beginning to analyze the concept, who continue with us at the text writing to read the text, and who, at the end, and this is a terrible thing for any museum to do, because one of the things that we should know when we're working with activists 
or many things. One is that we should not farm out the, the emotional labor to them. We need to do our own work because it is very emotional to do this kind of work. But what it meant and what it continues to mean for me is that I have a responsibility for the world that we share with them. But it also means that I make them, and this is a, I use this word negatively, it's not intended to be negative. I make them complicit in the creation of a narrative that they can also stand behind. And if both of us can stand behind that narrative together, then it means something about the shared futures that we want to create. How can we make ourselves so uncomfortable because our horizon is justice. And so I go back to this. Oh, this is my uncomfortable statement. Because to be honest with you, sometimes in the discussion around Brexit, around the immigrant problem or the refugee problem, one of the things I struggle with, and I really loved your, your image, Stephen, with the, 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 um, the white men list. And the reason for that is that I struggle with the idea that we have foreclosed the possibility of humanity for so many people. We, you, we describe them in such unhuman, inhuman ways. We actually create institutions where hu the human, the notion of the human, was defined by those white men in the past. And we continue to maintain that definition. And so I love this 1963 quote by James Baldwin, where what he asks us to do is to reimagine our conception of the human, of the public humanities institution, and stop making the human only one group of people who are going to include those others as we try to civilize them, very colonial construct, into liking the opera. Because at the end of the day, hip hop is as creative and as imaginative for other futures as other creative forms. And I want to stop, basically stop there. Are we in our institutions still thinking us is normalizing, and a them is incommensurable other, and that they will only be included in the us when they look like me. I want to ask. Thank you. <laughs> oh. To close, <laughs> I. No. No, I, I just one second. I want to do two quick things. And this is I always do it. Everyone is crying out for peace. Nobody is crying out for justice. That was Peter Tosh. He says, I don't want peace. I want equal rights and justice. And it's not that Peter Tosh wanted war, but what he wanted was the discomfort that helps us to sketch a horizon of justice. That's one thing. And the second thing that I want to say to you today, just because last week I gave a passionate lecture and the lady said to me, one of my colleagues who spoke with me, she said, you were so emotional. What I want to do, just because I'm, being, I'm useless now, right? I, and this is very useless. I was quoting just now Paul Gilroy, <laughs> Iris Marion Young, Anouk de Koning, so there is intellectual work behind it as well. <laughs> and the reason why I want to say this, a part of the act of exclusion in our own practice is to always think that the other, whether woman, racialized, gendered, is an emotional being. And we, man, white, institution, is rational. That's an enlightenment understanding that is quite strange. Even when the white man comes out with anger, you shouldn't do this. That's not anger, it's rational. 
we have to reorganize our thinking. Thank you.